Going? Now would be a good time. There we go. Good acoustics. OK, so what I've done is uh, put together a presentation. The first part of the presentation I presented at the BC uh, Nonprofit Housing Association last week. And it's, it's sort of a 15-minute presentation on what is Passive House. And it's for people who um, know about buildings, know about how to operate buildings, but know nothing about architecture or how to design buildings. So it's a real introduction to Passive House. And then I've added, since then, uh, a bit of information, a little bit more detail on uh, the process of, of designing Passive House, and a little bit on uh, what HCM, what we know at HCMA, and uh, the big we, so that uh, the hope is that when you're in a meeting with a client, uh, you're out there in the public, whatever, so that uh, everybody, everybody in the office has a little bit more understanding of what Passive House is and what HCMA is doing because we're doing lots on all fronts. So what is Passive House? Um, it comes from a German word, Passive House, which actually means like passive building. Uh, it, it's, it's not a fully passive as in um, completely off the, off the grid necessarily. It does take some energy to heat it and light it and all that sort of thing, but it's greatly reduced. So ultra or a high, uh, German developed method of designing and constructing high performance buildings. So it's high performance buildings. And uh, this is an early uh, passive house before it was passive house came on board. So in Regina, uh, in the 70s, the provincial government had some money and they designed the, uh, uh, what's it called? The conservation house in Regina in the early 70s. Super insulated walls that had <coughs> Uh, dampers that came in front of the windows to keep things warm at night. A real experiment, and, uh, and then they monitored it. I, I think someone actually lives in it now. They actually did sell it. In the 80s, you'll recognize this kind of a book. A lot of architects have a book like this in their office library somewhere. Uh, again, in the 80s, a lot more experimental work going on in Passive House. But it tended to be um, more single family residences, experimental, no real central organization of, of bringing all this information together. Uh, and until in Europe, it, uh, Ger I think it was Germany and Sweden, a number of building scientists got together in the 80s, late 80s, and developed this idea of passive house and, and a way of measuring and, and defining it. And this is the first passive house in Darmstadt. So Darmstadt is. Um, I've never been there, but uh, anyway, that's a bit of the mecca of, of Passive House. That's where the Passive House Institute is. That's where the first one is. And uh, there's a fellow who, uh, Dr. Feist, Feist, I think his name is, is still alive and well and leading the Passive House uh, Institute. And um, so he was involved in that very first project, developing it. And they've been working on it for the last 30, 40 years. And uh, what we have now, Passive Houses, could be a gym on the left, uh, North Park Passive House, HCMA in the middle. That's a six-unit apartment building. On the right-hand side is a project in, in Ottawa. It's affordable housing. And uh, it's, I think it's near completion of construction. Bottom left is a project that Elise, who uh, works in our Victoria office, she will be back from maternity leave <coughs> in July. That's a uh, elementary school. And on the top left is uh, affordable housing. So it's a mixed use building. Um, and, uh, and on the bottom right is the currently under construction, one of the two duplex buildings that we're, we're building now in Victoria uh, for the same client as the North Park Passive House, Rob and Mark Bernhardt. We're building that one plus another one beside it. And uh, so that'll be the next <coughs> set. Oh, and this is, so this is the pair of them on the rendering. Uh, the, this one on the left is going through a rezoning process, so it's taking a little longer. The one in the background and on the right is uh, under construction, so they're pouring concrete now. And uh, I'll use that a little bit later just as a little case study to show you some of the quick ideas or thoughts that went into designing that one. So a little snippet of currently what we've built and designed and under construction right now. 
Uh, there is another one, the Townley Lodge. I think I've got a picture in here somewhere. Townley Lodge is for the Greater Victoria Housing Society, and it's uh, 51 units of affordable seniors housing, and that's to passive house as well. Why would you build a passive house? Well, one of the reasons is reducing your energy to heat the building, greatly reduced, uh, increase uh, the comfort within, within, the, uh, within the building for the users, uh, improved air quality, and improve the building envelope, durability and longevity. When we design swimming pools, I think we're quite advanced in, in, in how we design buildings. You know, we put a lot of effort into it um, at HCMA. And, um, but generally, I think uh, the Passive House, we can, some of the, the thoughts behind how you would detail uh, a Passive House, we can bring into all of, all of our work. Say, whether it's single family residential or small residential or, or multi-unit residential towers, there's a lot to be learned um, there through Passive House. The basic, these are two projects in Whistler. The one on the top right is, is Austria House. Some of you may have been there in Whistler. Oh, missing a P, the in Pavilion. It's, uh, if you go to Lost Lake, that's where you rent your cross country skis and go skiing. So that was the first one in Canada. And then, uh, so Whistler has quite a few passive houses, mostly single family residence or, or duplexes. That's a duplex there in the middle. The basic principles, you conserve the energy, minimize your heat losses, and then you capture as much free energy as you can, maximize the heat gains. So a uh, little graphic to show that. Um, you know, the old school coffee pot, just a piece of glass, it's got your coffee in it, you're just constantly cranking heat into that thing and the heat's just dissipating. A passive house is closer to, say, the thermos. You put the hot coffee in there, tighten it up really well, it's insulated, there's no air leakages, so you're really conserving, um, minimizing the, uh, the heat loss. And then in terms of capturing the free energy, what you wanna do is, is capture the, the heat from all the appliances, the, kitchen, the fridge and the stove and all, the electrical, the people that are in it um, are good energy creators. For instance, in a school, uh, heating is not the issue in a passive house, it's actually cooling. So that school that Elise did, the, the biggest concern is uh, making sure that you can ventilate it. There's no problem heating it with all those kids and the computers. Um, yeah, and, and some sunlight. Isn't also the issue like air, fresh air circulation? Yes. Yeah. So ventilation is a big part of it, we'll get to that. And then the, the sun, which we, uh, the heat coming in from the sun. So in terms of conserving energy, it's the walls, roof, floors, windows, and doors. So improving the, the, the R value does that, on those. Does that automatically assume triple keys for the windows? Yeah, pretty much here, yeah. Until triple glaze becomes equivalent yeah, but with today's technology, yeah, it's triple glaze. Uh, and then minimize that surface area. So you're, if you're losing a certain number of watts per meter squared for an area of wall, uh, you want to reduce the amount. So a compact building form. And then minimize the air leakages. And so that's generally through the in building envelope detailing and then as well the windows and the doors, uh, better quality windows and doors. So as a strategy, just looking at that center image with the garage on the bottom level, if you're dealing with um, you're, you're minimizing your surface area, does that assume that that is fairly significantly insulated, like the ceiling of the garage? I haven't been to that building. My assumption is, looking at that, that the thermal line, uh, that the passive house is actually there. Yeah. That's the passive house, I'm guessing, because that garage door is not airtight, right? Are you going to get into the A little bit. I'm just wondering what the relationship is between airtightness, increased ventilation, and then mechanical and energy costs. So in other words, you're extracting fresh air and bringing it into a mechanical system instead of mechanical? Through heat recovery? Yeah. So uh, heat recovery ventilation, so as that <coughs> Air, as you're refreshing the air, 100% uh, of the air is leaving, 100% fresh air coming in, and, but you want to capture the energy from it. So a passive house, you need about sort of a 90% efficient HRV. 
And then there is also a heat source, and there's different ways of doing that heat source. Uh, it could be through the air. It could be through radiant. Depends on the size of the building, the type of the building. But the first thing is, in terms of conserving the energy, um, now that you've made it quite airtight, you've got to ventilate it, right? Manage and, and engineer that, that ventilation, but you don't want to lose the, the energy from the, heat, from the air. Yeah, in the summertime, you would turn off your, put the, the HRV to like bypass, so the air is going, but go, passing by, but it's not doing any uh, heat recovery. And then you open up the windows. Yeah. Simply put, in a, in a house, you just open up the windows. Uh, in terms of capturing the free energy, capture the solar energy, we, we do that all the time, right? You, you, um, you know, look at the sun path, where's the sun coming in, manage that. Uh, internal heat gains, talked about that, the people and the appliances. And then you add, you have to add some energy. And uh, this is a 700 watt hair dryer. And that is how much heat is required for the North Park Passive House dupe. Uh, sorry, North Park Passive House, 16 apartment building. Each of the two bedroom units has that much heat. And uh, we didn't have hair dryers. They, what we did is put um, uh, electric heating coil under the tile in the bathroom. So there's a two bedroom, one bathroom units. So there's a heating coil in a small bathroom. So that was like five feet by six feet of, of electric coil under the tile. And then one little electric um, convector heater wall mounted heater. And that was, that's about it for, um, for heating. The rest so of it's. Does it matter? You know, it, it's not about evenly distributing the heat throughout the unit. It's more about just adding some. You're adding some heat, and through the ventilation, you can pass it around. Okay. Yeah. So the actually at North Park, uh, there are three-store units that had these long stair down to the uh, the entrance, and it was a bit cool down there. So they're actually on two of the units that are like that. There actually is a, a, a tiny little space heater down at the bottom, so a little bit more than 700. But that's kind of not a lot of heat in the heating season. But you do have to add some heat. Uh, I talked about compact building form. Not every building has to be a cube. If you're, if you're building a, a really small building, the shape becomes more important. If you're doing a larger building, the shape becomes less important. So we're not restricted to cubes. So this, for instance, as, a, as I said, is a passive house. It's a U-shaped courtyard. The first two floors is a U-shaped courtyard. On the right is a more, more school space. And on the left, the four-story block is, is a, four, a social housing. So there's quite a lot of surface area. It's, it's not some big cube. Um, but you will actually notice the, the, the thermal envelope is actually you know, at the glazing level and back here at the glazing level. This, this sort of stuff is outside of the thermal envelope. So even if you have a very tight thermal envelope architecturally, it doesn't have to be a cube, right? You can extend. So this is all outside, and it's just about managing the thermal, thermal bridging. So again, the, the thermal envelope line is back there, and this is all outside. That whole eyebrow and everything is out. The monitor is outside of that thermal envelope, right? So you're not restricted to. Not every building has to be a cube. You know which, uh, with the, <coughs> which elevation? I believe this um, from the floor plan. I'm pretty sure this is kind of south-ish. So I'm pretty sure these are like east-west. That's uh, an east, east window south, I think. Uh, but this would be uh, probably impossible to make passive house. So important to do these kind of buildings. But just to give you a sense, if you have two people if you have two people sitting in here, there's awful lot of thermal bridges and auto, a lot of cold surfaces around it. So that kind of level of, of shape uh, would, would not work as a passive house. So you want to minimize the air, air leakage, because um, we, we lose a lot of heat just through air leakage. Like in a typical house, single family residents, if, if you do a blower door test and you figure out the accumulated, accumulated um, amount of air loss, like in my place, it's probably like a hole like this. So that's like having your window open always, right in the middle of winter, right? You wouldn't do that. 
and a passive house, you kind of want to bring it down. You can get it down to about that. And the, the amount of air that's, that's leaving is just through the little cracks in the windows and doors and a couple other little spots. But that's just air leaving. Yeah. 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 It's, <coughs> yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. So you do you do something like that, and it's like holy crap, that's pretty bad. Yeah. So, but in terms of the air leakage, it's really just about managing. Um, Managing the details. This is a detail at the North Park Passive House. So it's a wood frame construction, two by eights, and um, it's a semi balloon frame. So rather than having a stud coming up and a plate and the wall plate coming over to here, <clears throat> penetrating the air vapor barrier every, every joist, what we've done is the studs come up to here and then bolt a piece of wood on there, a few little holes, and then the joists are, are on um, hangers and pre-strip the air vapor barrier. So just continuity of that. It's just thinking about air vapor barriers in a different way. And um, so they were still able to frame the walls similarly, tilt them up and bolt things on, but managing that. And you'll also see one of the, one of the important things is to have a, a little chase here. Here it's a two by four chase on, on the warm side on the house side of the uh, air vapor barrier. And that's where uh, all the electrical data run, um, any of the ventilation. So the ventilation, you'll see a picture. Um, one, of the, one of the companies creates these nice little vents that are just three and a half inch diameter ductwork. And that fits nicely in a, in a stud. Um, and so, and then right here would also be where you have your receptacles, wherever they are so that you're not always cutting a hole in your poly, putting a receptacle on and pretending that you're sealing it off, which you're not, right? There's a lot of air. So the only time you break that air vapor barrier is things like a couple bolts or nails or that the HRV in and out exhaust and supply has to go through there. But as long as, now you're managing the five places or whatever that you're popping through that instead of totally perforating it. Well, it's a two by eight and a two by four. Yeah, so it ends up being about a foot, depending on how you do it. Sorry? Uh, two by four, just a two by four stud wall on the inboard. Do you need that for insulation, or just for? It's in this one, yeah. We did insulate it so it was a bit more uh, thermal. So you have here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's lots of different ways of doing it. Uh, the, this client, on this project, uh, we put the plywood out here, and this is just a membrane that went on there, and it was uh, sprayed in cellulose insulation. And a, yeah, and then bad insulation in the in the furring. But there's lots of different ways of doing it, right? This is this is just one. Is there a benefit of using uh, the membrane instead of uh, the hard surface on the inside? Um, OSB taped apparently works fairly well. The Bernhards did that on their on their house, um, but this was working better. Yeah, it's just fine tuning. Lots of options. Yeah. Just wondering if there's any there's going to be pros and cons, yeah. And the current building, we're doing a bit differently, and I'll show that later. So an HRV, uh, up in the right-hand corner, you can see the duct work. So it's just three and a half inch ducts um, running around, um, and the HRV there in the middle <coughs> prior to it going in. Um, and the, so, 100% fresh air managed when, when you need it, um, and 90% plus heat recovery on that, sort of 92%. Zender is a 
seems to be the go-to company for uh, HRVs at, at this sort of scale. Uh, if we do a larger building, it would be a, it would be a larger uh, HRV custom build probably. We'll, we'll deal with that. But even the, um, nor the Townley Place Seniors Affordable Housing, what we may end up doing is just having a series of these, uh, these type of units up here and, and stack them. So this um, could be in a closet in the hallway and it might supply uh, maybe a five or six uh, units um, with one HRV. But there'll be a balance. Uh, we'll figure out what's, what's the best. You know, there are other ones, little micro units, where you might have one in every unit. So there's pros and cons. Or, or the other option would be one unit, custom built unit, I guess, for, um, for the whole building. So we'll evaluate that when, when we get through rezoning and get into the design phase. And the, in the little red circle, they always have this, this little space heater. That one's big enough. To, that's 1,400 watt space heater. So that's, that's enough to heat uh, two of the two bedroom units. That's, um, you guys probably don't listen to CBC Radio Victoria, but that's Khalil Akhtar. He's a local uh, uh, CBC radio host. And he came and interviewed us there, learning about HRVs. Orient orientation to sun is important. <clears throat> don't need to say anything more than that, other than you want to bring the heat in when you need it. And uh, in, the, in the heating months, and you want to shade it in the cooling months, shade it in the cooling times of day, so east and west, manage the shading. So it's fairly fairly simple idea. This is a diagram that, that Heather created for the North Park Passive House that sort of summarizes all these things. So the sunlight coming in in the heating months, shading in, in the... Um, in the summer months when you don't want it. Uh, and there are PV panels on North Park. They managed to get enough on there to cover about 50% of the uh, electricity cost. If we didn't have the dormers that, that we had on there, we didn't actually, they talked about at the beginning of the design phase that we might put some PVs on there. They weren't sure. And through the design process with the planning department and neighborhoods, we ended up with these dormers. Uh, if we hadn't had the dormers, it could have maybe provided enough uh, PV array to, uh, to make it net zero. So hopefully for the next yeah, one. PVs or solar? Sorry? Photo PV, photovoltaic, electric, yeah. So in terms of certification, um, there's a, you can be a uh, Passive House certified designer and uh, the way of doing that, you take courses and you can either do an exam or you can be the principal designer on, on a passive house, so the one doing all the calculating and that. So I'll do that for the, the duplex that's under construction. The North Park project, our, our client, Mark Bernhardt, did all that because he wanted to get the certification. So um, either by the end of this year or early next year, I'll have that certification. So there's passive house designers, there's passive house professionals, and that's whether you're an architect or design professional or not. Um, but it's not required to have a certified passive house designer uh, on your team unless, say, the city of Vancouver has decided, say, for the Vancouver Fire Hall uh, proposal that's out right now, they decided that that was a requirement. So we have Rob Bernhardt as our certified passive house designer on our team, but that was a city of Vancouver decision that they wanted to have that requirement. You don't have to. It's, it's like LEED, right? You, you don't actually have to have a, do you know? I don't, you didn't you used to have, point, you get an extra point, yeah. but you don't have to have a <coughs> LEED AP on board. Um, and trades people and. Are you, are you signed up to do this as well? Mm -hmm. Like it may? Mm -hmm. Sorry for this? All right. Um, and trades people and products as well, but you don't actually have to use certified passive health products. You just have to prove it out, but it's easier if they are certified. So some of the numbers, the heating energy demand, uh, passive health gets very much into the numbers and Greek letters and things like that. So uh, the heating energy demand, and it's all metric too, 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year, A being annum, uh, you need to meet these. Uh, building air tightness, uh, it's 
0.6 of an air change at 50 pascals. It's um, primary, primary energy demand is, is the total amount of energy uh, to heat and not really cool, but heat and all the plug loads and everything. And that number is from the source of the energy. So it actually takes in the losses through transmission, which um, I think there's debate and discussion about that, whether, whether that really makes sense. But anyways, it's part of, of, of Passive House. Cause, um, but to some, you know, some people argue, well, it doesn't really matter. And I know, I think in Belgium, Elise was saying that um, they've taken that away in Belgium and they just, they calculate it at the building phase because they don't want to either penalize or, or, or give people an easier path just because of their energy source or where they are or, or that sort of thing. Here, we don't really have a choice of where our energy is. It's really not about that. So you wouldn't want to penalize somebody who happens to have massive energy losses through the transmission or make it easier for somebody else who has less. So it, it seems having that transmission losses in, in, inside the calculation really has nothing to do with the building itself. But, um, thermal bridge free design, psi has to be less than 0 0.01 watts per meter Kelvin. And I don't have a picture in my mind what that actually means. But anyways, the, um, uh, you sort of avoid, or it has to be thermal bridge free by that de definition, which means there can be some thermal bridging. I guess around you know window frames and things like that, but you can't have joists running straight through or great big chunks of steel running through your thermal envelope, things like that. And overheating, so uh, in there's a maximum 10% of uh, overheating permitted, and that's over 25 degrees Celsius. So those are the numbers that you have to hit to get certification. And the way they came up with this 15 kilowatt hours is evaluating, um, if you start over here, somewhere over here is a code built building. Um, it's, it's becoming more, more stringent. And in Vancouver, I think you're a bit more stringent. So who knows, it's somewhere around here now in Vancouver. As you start putting in money to triple glazed windows and expensive doors and some more insulation. You get to a point somewhere here where you can significantly reduce your mechanical system down to a little bit of heating coil, something like that. And then you reduce that capital and ongoing cost of, of that mechanical system. And it, it's somewhere around here where you get that you get that benefit. And then if you decide to keep being more efficient, you're, you're, you're spending more money. But the passive house is about hitting this, this sensible spot where, where it just makes sense. Um, but it's not about completely being zero in terms of your energy performance, but being a whole lot better. And, and just hitting that point where you can reduce your mechanical systems. Um, is there a Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Stay tuned. Um, the two buildings, and we've had that conversation. So the two built, the two fire halls that we know of that are certified on the um, Passive House Institute website. One of them says, um, however they worded it, basically, one of them said, yes, it's Passive House, but excluding the apparatus base. And the other one said the whole building follows passive house principles. So in a way, it doesn't, it doesn't, likely doesn't make sense to have the whole building meet passive house because of, of the base, Be, because of those doors that are opening and shutting, like to make those um, passive house would be either very difficult No, no, but pools, pools would be difficult. We've looked at that. There aren't any. Um, it may be difficult, but say office, school, manufacturing, I think there's some grocery stores. So maybe not every building, but most buildings. But yeah, something that's super, yeah, a pool with all the pumps and mechanical systems. But I have read an article, and they've looked at pools, 
and they've looked at um, at aspects of pools and how to reduce the energy consumption of them, not not to this level. So uh, that would be sort of leading edge research if we were I'm to sure look into it's that. Also Yeah. The city seems to be open to um, taking a passive approach to, let's say, uh, the residential that yes. would be from a certain element upward yeah. and, and sort of. And that, may, that makes sense because a commercial space with the doors opening and closing and usually fairly poor quality doors, because people are coming in and out all the time, right? You don't want to have three point locking yeah. passive house They're doors on a cafe, right? That's just not going to work. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They they understand that it's to be taken a approach. Right. So then you would take maybe from second or third floor up, the residential portion might be possible. But it's not just residential, uh, office, school. So uh, is it Vancouver School Board may be interested? We've been having chats with them. BC. BC. Yeah. Office for sure. I'm wondering with uh, pools being one of the, the types of buildings that we mess up. But I'm thinking about Hillcrest, if there is uh, an opposite kind of a, a use of uh, building type like an ice arena, mm -hmm. which is, you know, if it's all year round, then would, could that possibly make sense because of the uh, in recovery? Well, I think when we, don't you, I mean, when we pair a pool and a, an ice, we're already, you're already, you're already doing sort that. of transferring or benefiting from that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, gymnasium, there's, Few gymnasium, so the rec center part, maybe, but not the pool part. I think that would be difficult. Um, how do you design a passive house? You follow the basic principles. You model it with PHPP, which is the passive house planning package, which is really just a. You'll hear passive house people talk about PHPP a lot. It's an Excel sheet, and I'll. <laughs> it's a fancy Excel sheet. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. The same sort of form as an Excel spreadsheet, too. Yep. Uh, there, is, there is one test that you need to do on, on site, and that's the blower door test. And you usually do a couple one before you do drywall just to make sure you're doing okay, and then one when you're done drywall to prove that you're meeting that 0.6 air change at 50 pascals. So that's the only test, and that has to be third party. And then you take your drawings and the PHPP and send it off to a certifier. And uh, I, know, I know there's one person, Andrew Peel, in Canada. There might be a couple others in Canada who, who are certifiers. And then um, there's an institute in Ireland. It seems to be popular for, for certification. And you send it off, and they basically just redo. It's a theoretical thing. They don't go to site or anything like that. They just recreate the PHPP, make sure all the data is put in there properly. They'll look at yours and tell you where you've screwed up or, 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 or messed with the algorithms, if you have. But uh, they'll, so they'll create their own, and then, and then it's you're done. So it's easy peasy. What's that? Absolutely. <laughs> no, of course it made it easier. It, it's different. I mean, instead of uh, a binder like this, it's an Excel sheet. But uh, the Excel sheet is, is pretty thorough. Is, um, so we'll go there. <laughs> the argument is that you can achieve leads without even considering it. You know, you can, you can get a lead certified building without you thinking about what, what the, you know, where the opportunities are. You know, you just kind of, it's a reflection of what you build. Passive house is an approach that you embed it within the design process. And you're constantly kind of checking the design against the PHPP outputs to find out if you're compliant or not. That's the key difference that I see. Yeah, I don't think you could retroactively. It would be. I think you're modeling it and you're testing it. It's a real thing as opposed to this box I checked it. Yeah, lead is like a verification. Or even the energy modeling is lead for lead purposes. It's just like, I design this, you energy model it, you tell me how many points I get. That's, right. you know, it's inherently different yeah. about you embedding this in the process. Yeah, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't design a building, build a building, and then go, oh, I wonder if it's Passive House. That's just not going to happen. Uh, the amount of different thinking and, and detailing to be done. 
whatever, maybe in 15 years when this stuff is sort of embedded within the practice. You might get close. Yeah. So this is PHPP. And so it's just an Excel sheet, and it's got 36 tabs, lots of tabs. But you don't have to worry about all of them. Um, verification. So this is the verification page. And right at the beginning, and it, it just tells you what, what that number is. Oh, yeah, you have to be 15 here or less. Or 14. Yeah. Um, the air change here, uh, I think there's the primary energy demand. Well, that way I haven't put in all the data for that. So that's one that's got to be less than 120. This is the verification page that just says whether you meet it or not. Yes, no. Um, there's, there's tabs like this. So climate. One of, the, let's step back, one, one of the nice things about modeling a building this way, it is an Excel sheet. The software, the file, the software costs you, well, it's not software, the file costs you like uh, 300 bucks or something like that. You can run it on anything, anybody who, who knows about buildings and, and can get their way through an Excel sheet can model a, a, a simple building. Um, you don't have to rely on, on that third party. Um, you can quickly test and change stuff in here. And you can see um, in moments uh, the effects of changing the size of a window or moving or changing an R value, adding some more insulation to your wall. It's uh, put a number in, and you go look, and you can see the effects of it. So that, I think, is really helpful. And it's accurate. To if you're within the zone of, of of the energy efficiency of passive house, it's apparently very accurate, within five percent or something like that or so. Um, but you wouldn't use this for a building that's way off the scale, like a, a code built building that's using three four times as much energy as this. It, it wouldn't be accurate there. So it's it's. Um, but it's accurate at that same sort of level. So you. you uh, no, they're, they're, they're sort of different. Right, so yeah. it's a fire you've been acting when you draw it from the other side Yes, and there is also a, um, an Excel, um, sorry, a SketchUp plugin <clears throat> where you can do that. So you could change in your, in your SketchUp mm -hmm. model and then um, do a Couple steps, and then and then it'll it'll put that change data into here, and you can see it. So it's a couple steps. I'll, I'll show you the um, SketchUp briefly. So climate data, you put that in, and there's standard standard locations. So Victoria, they've got the data in there. If you're designing a building that's in in a location where they haven't put the data in, the Passive House Institute goes and creates that for you. I think there's a small fee. Uh, U values. This is very helpful. So uh, here's a a wall, and you put in. 